Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service here at Greece Baptist Church in sunny Rochester, New York. It's Sunday the 29th of May. Today is the seventh Sunday of Easter on our liturgical calendars. This is also a holiday weekend as tomorrow our nation remembers those who've given their lives to serve our country's armed forces. We'll express our gratitude and a tribute for those brave men and women a little later in the worship service. This morning, we also want to pray for the communities of Uvalde, Texas and Buffalo, New York, who both have suffered horrific violence uh, in recent days. We have watched over the years as these kinds of shootings have become almost a regular part of our daily life with innocent people gunned down while shopping for groceries or attending a concert or a movie or dancing in a nightclub or attending a Bible study or a worship service or even just going to school. As we begin our worship this morning, instead of starting with a musical prelude, I want us to begin with a moment of silence for the victims of these massacres and with a prayer for our nation. We're going to join in a prayer that's being offered up in churches around the county this morning. The prayer was written by the Reverend Stephen Lane, the Episcopalian Bishop Provisional of Rochester. But first, let's pray in silence. Now, as we pray, when I say, loving God, your response will be, make us instruments of your peace. Loving God, make us instruments of your peace. Giver of life and love, you created all people as one family and called us to live together in peace. Surround us with your love as we face again the tragedy of gun violence. Loving God, make us instruments of your peace. For those who were killed in Buffalo and Uvalde, the brave ones who died protecting others, those who were wounded and hospitalized, the traumatized and grieving survivors, loving God, make us instruments of your peace. God of righteousness, you have granted our leaders power and responsibility to protect us and to uphold our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Strengthen their devotion to our common life and give them clarity of purpose. For all who bear such responsibility, for all who struggle to discern what is right in the face of powerful political forces, loving God, make us instruments of your peace. God of compassion, we give you thanks for first responders, police officers, firefighters, EMTs, and all those whose duties bring them to the streets, the schools, the malls, and the homes where the carnage of gun violence takes place every day. Give them courage and sound judgment in the heat of the moment and grant them compassion for the victims for our brothers and sisters who risk their lives as they rush to our aid, loving God, make us instruments of your peace. Merciful God, bind up the wounds of all who suffer from gun violence, those maimed and disfigured, those left alone and grieving, and those who struggle to get through one more day. Bless them with your presence and help them find hope for all whose lives are forever changed and broken by the scourge of gun violence. Loving God, make us instruments of your peace. For those who from malice or illness are the instruments of violence and death, loving God, make us instruments of your peace. God who remembers, may we not forget those who have died more than 30,000 in the past year, in the gun violence that we have allowed to become routine. Receive them into your heart and comfort us with your promise of eternal love and care. For all who have died, those who die today and those who will die tomorrow, loving God, make us instruments of your peace. 
God of tender mercy, be with those who feel overwhelmed, enraged, frustrated, and demoralized by the plague of gun violence. Give them a sense of your presence and plant in them the seed of hope. For those whose hope for life in this world is shattered and broken, loving God, make us instruments of your peace. God of justice, help us, your church, find our voice. Turn us from the worship of power. Give us courage to confront our false gods and to protest the needless deaths. Help us rise above our dread that nothing can be done and grant us the conviction to advocate for change. For your dream of a world where children are safe and all of us live together without fear, loving God, make us instruments of your peace. All this we pray in the name of the one who offered his life so that we might live, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Ellen Poole is going to come now and lead us in our call to worship. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. The Spirit of God bids us come. Let everyone who hears within their hearts come. Hear the whole earth rejoice and the coastland sing of our God's steadfast love. We, we come, come to, to rejoice, rejoice in the, the Holy One, One our God. God. We, we give, give thanks for God, for God sets, sets us free. Let everyone who is thirsty for the spirit come. Let anyone who wishes come and receive the water of life as a gift. We come, we come to, to rejoice, rejoice in the, in the Holy, Holy One, One, our God. God. We, we give, give thanks for God's steadfast love. love that brings joy to our hearts in the night, lights our lives like the dawn, and sets us free. Amen. In honor of all who have served in our nation's armed forces, our first hymn this morning will be the Navy Hymn. It's number 358 in our gray hymnals. Eternal Father, strong to save.
Thank you, you may be seated. Our first reading this morning comes from John chapter 17, verses 20 to 26. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may, may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Thus ends the reading. Thank you, Alan. Next Sunday, we're going to have our semi-annual meeting. And this morning, just for a moment, I asked if uh, Chuck would give us a quick report from the Board of Trustees. Are you there, Chuck? Can you unmute? Yes, I believe so. Good morning. Is it working? Yep, there we go. Go ahead, Chuck. Great. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for all the uh, help this uh, past year or two. If we've had such a difficult time with uh, trying to scramble a bit, and with Steve's leadership and Cheryl, we've been able to keep services going and to keep the all the uh, building in shape and to keep folks engaged, which has really been good. First of all, obviously want to thank everybody for their donations and their uh, continued to support, but also it was very gratifying the past a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, we had such a good turnout for a, a work day. It was really uh, helpful to see everybody there and to get everything done. And because of the changes in uh, the status of uh, COVID, we're, we were able to enjoy uh, donuts together, which is always a, a treat every year, every time. Uh, what was going to be our new, I think, um, problem that we can solve rather easily, we're gonna to have to have a list of folks and we'll work on that for to, to be on call for various things. We might need a door open. We might need a little snow shoveling done. As we have more folks in the building, it's obvious that we're gonna need more kind of short short uh, notice uh, help. So I appreciate all the people that have done that over the years and we're gonna have to expand that a bit, but we are in good, in good shape and financially sound and it's wonderful. So thank you all. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you for that report. At this time, we're going to take just a few moments. <coughs> Excuse me. This weekend, we remember and honor those of our community who gave their lives in service to this country. For some of us, it's a parent. For some, it's a child or a neighbor. So many who responded to the call for duty and ended up offering up the ultimate sacrifice. In these next few moments, as we offer our silent prayers of gratitude, I invite anyone who is here to speak out loud the name of someone who gave his or her life for our country serving in the armed forces, a family member, a neighbor, someone from the community who made this ultimate sacrifice for all of us. And then we'll watch a short video that pays them tribute. Let's offer some silent prayer.
Douglas Silvernail. Alonso Grant, World War One. Dick Dunham, Vietnam. To the brave men and women who stood up for freedom, who answered the call and fought for our nation, who paid the ultimate price and never came back. To the American soldier, we thank you. To the mothers and fathers who raised a hero, to the brothers and sisters with an empty space, to the sons and daughters who have only memories, to the wives and husbands who bear the void with pride, to all who've lost a soldier they love, no gift could repay your sacrifice, no tribute could match our admiration, no word can contain our gratitude, but still, it deserves to be said, we remember you, we salute you, and we honor you today. Our litany today is from the Christian Reformed Center for Public Dialogue. Please join me in our litany. We come to you broken, Lord Jesus. We come to you groaning along with creation. We are pummeled by the headlines, heartsick over the divisions in our communities and neighborhoods, buffeted by the injustices we see around us. Your good creation is sick, Lord, and we cry out. Christ is making all things new. We confess that the brokenness of our world is our brokenness too. We confess that too often we turn away. We confess that too often we resist the convicting work of your Holy Spirit. Christ is making all things new. We see that this country treats some better than it treats others. We see that safe drinking water, quality education, and even a safe walk home are not guaranteed for all citizens of this country. We mourn broken treaties. Your good creation is sick, Lord, and we cry out. Christ, Christ is, is making, making all things new. We see the struggles of refugees waiting in a broken system. We see the struggles they face to find affordable housing, English classes, safe communities, welcoming friends in their new country. Christ, Christ is, is making, making all things new. Reveal your sons and daughters, God. May we answer the groans of creation like midwives ready to welcome a new world where the lame walk, the blind see, and the captives are set free. Christ, Christ is, is making, making all things new. Your promises are good. Your promises are sure. 
Help us to see you at work in your world. Christ is making all things new. People loved by God, fix your eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Christ is making all things new. Call us to participate with you in the renewal of all things. We know that we will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Take heart, God's people. Christ is making all things new. Thank you, Pastor Cheryl. Well, my intention for this morning's sermon was to go back one last time to John's vision of the new Jerusalem at the end of the book of Revelation. I was going to tie together some observations about all those new things that God continues to bring into being for us. But this week, as happens all too frequently these days, those plans got put on hold as we were all horrified to hear reports of yet another senseless act of violence. This time, a school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, that left 19 fourth grade students and two of their teachers dead. We were horrified, but not shocked, because we hear about all too many of these stories like that these days. They've become a very predictable part of everyday life. There have been 27 school shootings so far in 2022. Over 70 times this year, guns have been fired on school property. And we're not even halfway through the year yet. In the state of Texas, this is the 176th school shooting since 1970. I'm not real good at math, but that's more than three a year for 50 years. Today in America, gun violence is the number one cause of death for children. It's the number one cause of death for teenagers. Think about that for a minute. Not car accidents, not illnesses and diseases, gun violence. So the Uvalde school shooting is nothing new. It's just one of the worst ones yet. So we're keenly aware of it. We don't even hear about the minor shootings, but every one of those shootings leaves children wounded or dead. It leaves families and communities traumatized. This shooting was a particularly heinous one, even compared to many of the worst cases we've seen through the years. The 21 dead in Uvalde was more than the 10 who died in 2005 when a 16-year-old boy in Minnesota shot his grandfather and his grandfather's friend and then took his grandfather's guns down to the school in Red Lake Senior High and killed seven more people. It's more than the 10 people who died in 2018 when 17-year-old student at Santa Fe High School opened fire in an art classroom. It's more than the 15 who died in 1999 at Columbine High School in Colorado, when two teenage boys went on a shooting spree. It was more than the 17 who were killed at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, by a 19-year-old former student in 2018. Not as many as the 27 killed by a 20-year-old shooter at Sandy Hook Elementary School, 10 years ago in 2012. Most of his victims were six or seven years old. This time the killing was done by a disturbed 18 year old high school dropout who a couple of days after his 18th birthday legally purchased two powerful semi-automatic guns, a bunch of ammunition and some body armor. He would not have been allowed to walk into a bar and purchase a beer as an 18 year old. He would not have been allowed to walk into a convenience store and purchase a pack of cigarettes as an 18 year old. And yet this troubled 18 year old kid with a grudge could walk into a gun store and legally purchase all of this lethal armament. 
That's the law. And this massacre, I'm afraid, is what we've gotten used to. In each of these atrocities, the numbers vary a bit. The names and the locations change, but the story is pretty much the same, isn't it? A disturbed individual, a loner, an outsider, a misfit, whose thoughts increasingly turn to rage and violence, who has easy access to ruthlessly efficient killing technology, armors up, walks into a public place and starts shooting. And we've learned it can be anywhere. It can be a school. It can be in a church. It can be in a movie theater or a softball diamond or a country music festival or a nightclub or a Walmart or a grocery store. In a flash, a place where innocent people were going about their normal activities is transformed into a war zone. And then after these things happen, in another flash, we all engage in another kind of battle. Folks on the left and folks on the right trot out all of their old talking points about gun control and have at it. From one side, we hear guns don't kill people. It's people that kill people. And since criminals don't obey laws, passing new laws won't stop them. And that's true. From the other side, we hear that we're the only country in the world where these things happen routinely, and that if owning guns made us safer, we would be the safest country in the world since we have 400 million guns for our 300 million people. And that countries like Australia and New Zealand responded to mass shootings by legislating strict gun control measures and since then have had virtually no mass shootings. And those things are true too. And then there are things that we hear over and over again that are just not true. It's pointless to pass any gun control law because there's no one single law that would stop all the shootings. Let's think about that for a moment. We know that driving automobiles can be dangerous. Deadly accidents can happen. My mom was killed in a car accident. And there is no single law we could pass that would stop traffic fatalities from happening. That's true. But that doesn't mean we pass no laws about driving. We require that drivers be trained and licensed. We require cars to be registered and regularly inspected. We have speed limits. We have traffic lights. We have seat belt mandates. And in some cases, we determine that certain people should not be allowed to drive anymore because they pose a danger to the safety of others. There's no single law we could pass that would stop every car accident, true, but we have a ton of laws that reduce the frequency of accidents and reduce the number of fatalities that result when they do happen. And then the politicians get up to the microphones and they say, well, this is not the time to talk about this. In the raw moments of tragedy, when emotions are inflamed, we should focus our energies on consoling the victims and not having political arguments. And that would be true too, if there was ever a time in this country when we did not have a fresh atrocity to mourn. And then we preachers step up into the pulpits on Sunday morning, and what do we say? Well, that depends on how willing we are to get ourselves into hot water. If we care about our paychecks and we care about our careers and we're not getting close to retirement age, then we'll be reluctant to speak out because if we do, we'll be accused of politicizing what happened. And many people feel that preachers should just stick to the lectionary text for the day keep our noses out of the hot button issues. 
So our lectionary texts for this morning are about Paul and Silas, who were jailed for disturbing the peace. They're about Jesus, who prayed for unity with his disciples in the upper room, and they're that final vision of the New Jerusalem in John's book of Revelation, which I had planned to preach on this morning. So let me take a quick poll. How many of you have been talking about Paul and Silas this week with your friends and neighbors? How many of you have been thinking about the disciples in the upper room and what Jesus said to them that day in Jerusalem? Huh? How many of you have been thinking about the new Jerusalem the coming in the end of the book of Revelation? Yeah, me neither. So every preacher in America today didn't get a lot of sleep last night. No matter what their political stripe or persuasion, no matter what their denomination, because every preacher in America today had to make the same choice I had to make, getting ready to preach. Do we address the issue that's burning in so many minds and hearts this morning? Or do we have a moment of silence? Say that we're keeping the families of the victims in our thoughts and our prayers and change the subject. This is Memorial Day weekend. And I wish we could just look away from all this gun violence madness and just have a nice service with some appreciative words about the men and women who sacrificed their lives for our freedom. And then nobody will be mad at me tonight or tomorrow morning. But I couldn't make that choice this morning because I'm just sick and tired of changing the subject and trying to pretend that somehow there's something normal about all of this. And in fact, I've reached the point where I don't even wanna use that phrase in our thoughts and prayers anymore when we're in situations like this. All of us say that, don't we? Well, the families of the victims are in our thoughts and our prayers. But what does that actually mean? Does it mean anything anymore? Or is it just our way of saying, you know, this is so horrible, I can't think of what to say about it. And honestly, I'm not gonna do anything to change it. So I'll just say something that sounds nice and pious. Frankly, I don't think very many of us are really thinking about this problem or really praying about it. Because thinking and praying are both intentional ways of directing our minds and our hearts into a receptive position. That's what prayer is all about. We're not telling God what to do. We're not informing God of what God needs to fix. We're opening our hearts and our minds and putting ourselves into the position of receivers of information. It's putting ourselves in a position to listen to try and understand what is being said to us. When we really think about something or really pray about something, we're opening up our hearts and minds. We're offering ourselves up to be moved by some new knowledge or new experience or new way of doing things. And to be honest, I don't see much of that going on when it comes to the debate about guns in this country. We spout cliches, we post memes on our Facebook pages, and then we call each other names for a few days. And that isn't thinking. And if by prayer we just mean, well, this makes me feel bad, but there's nothing I can do about it, so God, you take care of this, well, that's not really praying either. There is a legitimate place in prayer to express our frustrations and uncertainty when we don't know what to do. But that is so that we can offer ourselves up for God to show us what we can do to make a positive difference. It's not just handing the problem over to God and checking out. And I do believe that there are things each and every one of us can do that would help to move our country in a direction away from hate and violence and fear. I believe that with all my heart. That's why I'm a preacher. That's why I'm standing in this pulpit and I'm here with you folks today because I believe that.
But since we haven't figured out yet what those things are, meaningful prayer in this situation really means opening up our minds and our hearts so that God can show us what those things are that can make a difference. And one thing I think we've all realized by now is that what we're doing now does not work. This ideological stalemate between right and left, the congressional impasse, the angry public debate that's inflamed by social media and misinformation and misdirected rage, this does not work. Things are not getting better. We can't just keep calling each other names and keep ourselves locked in the same arguments and have any hope to make things change. We're stuck in a box. And there's plenty of blame to go around for who built the box or who maintains the box or who perpetuates or strengthens the walls of the box. Politicians and lobbies on both the right and the left have plenty of blame to shoulder for this, but that's not the point. The point is, how do we get out of this box? How do we find new ways to think and act about this? Well, I wanna give you one example this morning. And then I'll go home and you can all call me on the phone this afternoon and yell at me for what I said or didn't say. Some time ago, I shared part of an article with you written by a woman named Glennon Doyle after another one of these horrific shootings some years ago. And I wanted to share that with you again now because I think it points us in a very positive direction to think about how we can all make a positive change in reducing violence around us. Doyle wrote about meeting with her son's fifth grade teacher to talk about violence in society and kids' feelings in the classroom and all those different things. And the teacher told her about one of the strategies that she uses in her classrooms. Every Friday afternoon, Doyle writes, she asks her students to take out a piece of paper and write down the names of four children with whom they'd like to sit the following week. The children know that the request won't necessarily be granted, but they're asked to do it every week. And she asks the students to nominate one of their fellow students who they believe had been an exceptional classroom citizen that week. All the ballots are handed into the teacher and the kids go home for the weekend. And every single Friday afternoon after the students went home, she takes out those slips of paper and places them in front of her and studies them. She looks for patterns. Who is not getting requested by anybody else? Who can't think of anybody that they'd like to sit next to to request? Who never gets nominated to be the classmate of the week? Who had a lot of friends on their list the week before, but there's none on the list this week? Now, she's not really looking to change her seating chart when she does this. What she's doing is she's looking for lonely children. She's looking for children who are struggling to connect with other children. She's identifying the little ones who are falling through the cracks of the class's social life. She's discovering whose gifts are going unnoticed by their peers. And she's pinning down right away who's being bullied and who's doing the bullying. As a teacher, parent, and lover of all children, Doyle writes, I think this is the most brilliant love ninja strategy I have ever encountered. It's like taking an x-ray of the classroom to see beneath the surface of things and into the hearts of the students. It's like mining for gold, the gold being those children who need a little help, who need adults to step in and teach them how to make friends, how to ask others to play, how to join a group, or how to share their gifts. But it's a, and it's a bully deterrent, because every teacher knows that bullying happens usually outside of her eye shot, and that often kids being bullied are too intimidated to share. 
But as she said, the truth comes out in these safe, private little sheets of paper. As the teacher explained this simple, ingenious idea, Doyle writes, I stared at her with my mouth hanging open. How long have you been using this system? I asked. Ever since Columbine, she said. Every single Friday afternoon since Columbine. Good Lord. This brilliant woman watched Columbine knowing that all violence begins with disconnection. All outward violence begins as inner loneliness. She watched that tragedy knowing that children who aren't being noticed may eventually resort to being noticed by any means necessary. And so she decided to start fighting violence early and often in the world that was within her reach. What my son's teacher is doing, Doyle writes, when she sits in her empty classroom studying those lists written with shaky 11-year-old hands is saving lives. I'm convinced of it. And what she's learned while using this system is something that she already had known, that everything, even love, even belonging, has a pattern in it. She finds the patterns, and through those lists, she breaks the codes of disconnection. And then she gets the lonely kids the help they need. What a way to spend a life looking for patterns of love and loneliness, stepping in every single day and altering the trajectory, the trajectory of our world. I think Doyle's article offers a key for us that could help us unlock the solution to our violence problem in this country. Our society badly needs to have its trajectory altered. And we need to be willing to step in and really be about the business of connecting people who are disconnected. That is the mission of this church. It's to connect people to be a community builder. You see that on the front page of our newsletter every month that goes out in the mail to you. Jesus said that he came into this world to save the lost. And his call for us to follow him means exactly this. We need to be willing to step in and be about the business of connecting people who are disconnected. When we think about the young men who commit these horrendous school shootings, we can talk about mental illness. We can talk about poor parenting. We can talk about the lack of role models or the effects of being bullied. But however they got to where they are now, somewhere along the way, these young men who perpetrated these horrors just got really lost. And no one stepped in to intervene to save them. And the problem we have today with this debate about gun control is that it's all about trying to change people's minds. And most everybody I know has already made up their mind. I suspect most everybody you know has too. And they aren't particularly interested in having their opinions or views changed. If we have any hope of fixing this problem, it's going to come from changing hearts, not from changing minds. It's going to come by connecting the disconnected, by reaching out to those who are lost. It's going to come by us opening our hearts and our minds to hear the whispers of grace that can bring hope to those who seem lost beyond hope. So in the end, we do need thoughts and prayers, but not those empty platitudes that we utter when we can't think of anything better to say or do. What we need is the discipline of actually focusing our thoughts and prayers on opening up our hearts and minds to listen and be changed by the spirit of God's love. May God give us the courage and the wisdom to look for patterns of love and loneliness in the lives of those around us. 
to see the lost souls, not just as a threat to our safety, but as children of God who need to experience the healing power of God's love. And may we be willing to step in every single day. And for each one of us in our own small way to alter the trajectory of our world. Let us pray. Gracious God, our hearts ache for all of the victims of violence in this country. And they also ache having to listen over and over and over again to the arguments and the fights that are really only aimed at winning verbal victories and aren't aimed at changing anything. Help us to get beyond all that. Help us to get out of this box that we are in. Help us to listen to each other, right and left, conservative and liberal. Help us to see the people around us who may be slipping away and may be lost and find ways to throw them lifelines, to bring them back. Help us to connect to people and to build this community. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This time we're going to show our gratitude to God through the giving of our tithes and offerings. The ushers are going to come around here in the sanctuary. Those of you who are watching on Zoom or on video, I invite you to go to our church website, greasebaptistchurch.org. You can show your gratitude to God by making a donation there using the donate button on the home page. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the privilege of partnering with you and with each other for the work of ministry. We know that you will bless our efforts and contributions towards spreading your good news. We ask that you would affirm your love, grace, and provision for each giver in our midst. Thank you for their heart for the ministry. Let them continue to give with cheerfulness and full trust that you will never fail them in their time of need. Amen. Let them in, Peter. They are very tired. Give them couches where the angels sleep. And light those fires. Let them wake whole again. To brand new dawns. Fired with the sun. Not wartime's bloody guns. May their peace be deep. Remember where the broken bodies lie. God knows how young they were to have to die. God knows how young they were to have to die. Give them things they like Let them make some noise Give roadhouse bands Not golden harps To these our boys And let them love Peter Cause they've had no time They should have trees And bird songs And hills to climb The taste of summer in a ripened pear And girls sweet as meadow winds With flowing hair Tell them how they are missed And say not to fear It's gonna be all right 
with us down here. seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, on this Memorial Day weekend, we remember and give thanks for those who have given their lives in the service of our country. When the need was greatest, they stepped forward and did their duty to defend the freedoms that we enjoy and win the same for others. Oh God, you yourself have taught us that no love is greater than that which gives itself for another. These honored dead gave the most precious gift they had, life itself, for loved ones and neighbors, for comrades and country, for us. Help us to honor their memory by caring for the family members they've left behind by ensuring that their wounded comrades are properly cared for, by being watchful caretakers of the freedoms for which they gave their lives, and by demanding that no other young men and women follow them into a soldier's grave unless the reason is worthy and the cause is just. Holy One, help us to remember that freedom is not free, there are times when its cost is indeed dear. Never let us forget those who paid so terrible a price to ensure the freedom would be our legacy. Though their names may fade with the passing of generations, may we never forget what they have done. Help us to be worthy of their sacrifice, O oh God. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 712 in the gray hymnal. The kingdom of God is justice and joy. It may not be familiar to everyone, so Pastor Cheryl is going to play it once all the way through. So we hear it, and then we will uh, stand in body, mind, or spirit and sing together the kingdom of God is justice and joy. Kingdom. 
Let us go forth into the world in peace and dedicated to your service, O Lord. Let us hold fast to that which is good, render to no person evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the needy and afflicted, and honor all people. Let us love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may God's blessing be upon us and remain with us always. Amen.